confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal where God sent fire from the mountaintop to consume the offering of Elijah and uh, the prophets of Baal were slaughtered and this seems like this really great achievement sort of milestone in Elijah's life but then immediately following that he faces a threat on his life and it pushes him into a really dark place. It pushes him into a really uh, deep depression to where he actually says this in, in chapter 19, uh, verse 4. He says, it is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life for I'm no better than my father's. He says, it's enough. It's enough, right? He, he says, I just can't take any more. And he asked God to take his life. But God is not interested in taking Elijah's life. God has a plan for Elijah. And so he begins to show that plan. But we took some time last week to look at, at the state where Elijah found himself and the way that he says, I am no better than my father's. And we said, this is, this is sort of his way of crying out. He cries out to God to say, it's enough. I can't take any more. I'm dying. Take me. And he said that a lot of times when people are having these thoughts, that they send different messages to the people around them to cry out. And sometimes it's not as simple as I think I want my life to end. Sometimes it's a lot more difficult for us to interpret and understand what someone is going through. But God understood. He understood where Elijah was. And I want us to understand where Elijah was because I, th I it is important. This isn't I think or I feel. This is I know that it is important that we as believers, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, that we, that we can sit with people in their time of darkness, that we can understand where, what people are going through, that we hear that message that says, I'm crying out for help, I need help, that we hear it and that we can be sensitive to it and respond in an appropriate way. And so to that end, and let me just say this, I know that suicide is not a topic that we talk about a lot in, in our culture. And it's, it's one of those things where it's like, when things are good in your life, when things are going well, when you just look at your life and say, life's so great, like, I'm too you know, blessed to be stressed, right? You, you see those things, and it's like, it doesn't make any sense. And yet, statistics would tell us that if people, when people are being honest in counseling sessions with their therapist, that a lot of people a lot, the majority of people at one time or another have thoughts that maybe they'd like for their life to just end, to end the pain, whether it's physical or emotional or relational, whatever sort of the situation is, that there are a lot of people who feel this, this way. And it's important that we talk about it because here is what I see from my own experience and certainly from the scriptures, and that is that when there are things inside of us, they hold power over us. When there are things that we are experiencing internally, that those things can hold power over us. There, there's an expression, confession is good for the soul, and here's the reason. It's because sometimes those things that are inside of you, they need to come out. Because immediately upon them coming out of you, they begin to lose their influence over you. When you are caught up in some sort of sin, when there's some sort of activity that you know is not God honoring, that is destroying your life, your relationships, your future, and you just finally let that out, it immediately begins to lose its power over your life. When you share that with someone, a friend, a pastor, or a mentor, a, maybe even just a stranger on the bus, when you share that with someone, the burden of it is immediately lessened. I hear a lot of people, uh, a lot of confessions. Over my time of pastoring, I've heard a lot of different confessions of a lot of different things, and I've been asked more than once, doesn't that get tiresome? Like, don't you get tired? Like, what do you do when you hear somebody confess to this or, or that or whatever? And my answer, I, I, I never get tired of it 
Because to me, confession is a place of victory. When someone reaches the point that they're willing to say, this is what is inside of me, and they're willing to bring it out and lay it out before me and God and everybody else and just be honest about where they are, that is where victory begins. And if we're going to see in our culture, in our Christian culture, victory over depression and anxiety, fear and suicide, if we're going to see victory over that, it begins with being honest and saying, this is what is happening inside of me. And I need to share it. I need to bring it out so that we can talk about it. So that it isn't something that is so stigmatized that it can't be mentioned. So we talked about it last week. We're going to talk about it a little bit more this week. Now the story of Elijah, it goes on from where we were last week. Last week we ended at this point where he is suicidal, where he just wants his life to end, and God brings him nourishment, God brings him a future, God brings him a mission, right? We, we, but we end saying, listen, let's not move past this point where Elijah is waiting there with open wounds. And we talked about at some length about why we like scars that show where people have healed from things in their past and why we have difficulty with open wounds. And a, a point that I wanted to make last week, and I'm not sure that I made it very well, because I asked Rusty what he thought about it, and he said, did you say that? Um, so the point I want to make is, is that it isn't, just, it isn't just that God wants to be our healer. It isn't just that God is our healer, because he certainly is. But God did not think it enough simply to be a God who heals. He did not think it enough simply that Jesus would be one who heals throughout his ministry, brought healing to people. And the healing that he brought to people was not just a healing of casting out demons, not just one of healing physical infirmity, but it was certainly one to heal the broken minds that he saw. It was certainly a ministry where he saw people who were suffering with depression and and feelings, and he brought them healing. But it wasn't enough even that Jesus would be our healer. It isn't enough just that the scriptures tell us that by his stripes we are healed. But that when Jesus was resurrected, when he was brought, when he came back into his physical form, what did it look like? Was it glorious? Certainly. When we see Jesus in eternity, will we be able to recognize him? I believe we absolutely will. Will he look like the paintings that we have seen of, you know, you know like, like me, but with long hair and glowing with, I, I doubt that, right? I doubt he looks like, you know, some Anglo dude. Um, he, he ought to look pretty Jewish, because he was. Um, so here's the thing that I think will make Jesus stand out is I think that he'll have wounds, not scars. Because when we read the story of Jesus coming in contact with, with Thomas, he doesn't say, here, Thomas, feel my scars. All apologies to that song that says, put your hand in the nail-scarred hand. I don't think Jesus' hands are scarred. I don't think the one who takes the wounds of all of the world, I don't think that he wears simply the scars. I think that he shows the wounds. When he tells Thomas to feel his side, he doesn't say, feel the bump on my side. Thomas puts his hand into the wound on Jesus' side. It isn't enough that God sent a healer, but God sent a healer who would be wounded. And as we deal with people in our lives who are wounded, it is okay for us to be wounded too. It is okay to sit with someone and say, I see your wounds, here are mine. Now, God the Father doesn't express that in the way he deals with Elijah, but I want to look at how he deals with Elijah today because these next few verses in chapter 19, they pick up the idea of where Elijah was And it shows how God wanted to restore Elijah to health. How he wanted to bring him back to being one who is not despairing for life, but one who is filled 
with life, who is filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And we begin to see that in, Eli- in Elijah's story in 1 Kings chapter 19. In verse 9, it says this. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. Now, previous to this in verse 8, it says that Elijah was to spend 40 days traveling from where he was to Mount Horeb. It was a journey of about 250 miles, 250 miles that he has gone. And then in verse 9, he arrives at Mount Horeb and he took lodging in a cave. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And there's a couple of different ways when we ask, what are you doing? What are you doing here we can sort of mean that in a couple of different senses. For instance, if I said, like, if, you know, if I ran into, you know, Jared at McDonald's, I'd be like, well, what are you doing here? And he, or he might say, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to eat this. Like, this is not good for you. Why are you here? Like, I'm just here to use the ATM or whatever, right? But, you know, we say, what are you doing here? Like, why are, why are you here? Justify it. Explain why you're here. Well, Jesus isn't asking him that. The Lord's not asking him that in that sense. He knows why he's there. He was called to be there. He went there because God had told him to go there. So it's like the why is, well, he's being obedient, but it's, it's bigger than just the why. It's not just the motivation. And it's not even, you know, what are you doing here? My, my question, like the actual activity, like what is it that you are doing or going to do here in this time, in this place? But it's more than that. What God's doing here is he's asking Elijah What is his perspective on his life? What is is his overarching understanding, his overview of what it is that has brought him here? Because Elijah could have answered this in several different ways, right? He could have taken this and answered any of the questions that I just said. Like, well, what am I doing here? I'm here because you told me to be here. What am I doing here? Just chilling, chilling in a cave, you know, just hanging out, trying to stay dry, right? A lot of different ways that he could have sought to answer this question. Here's how he answers it. In verse 10, he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. He says, I'm I'm jealous for I am jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. This is one of the first times that God is called the God of hosts to sort of capture God in his, in his position over all of creation. He captures this in this expression, the God of hosts. It's a very humble expression that Elijah uses here to recognize the majesty of God. And he says, I am jealous for God. I've been very jealous for God, which isn't to say I'm jealous of God. It's like, well, you're God. I don't get to be God. I'm so jelly. That's not it, right? It's not jealous of God. What he's saying instead is he's saying, listen, I have been working hard. I've been striving for you. I've been working hard for you in the face of all of these people, your people, by the way, all of your people who have not been working hard, who in fact, who have absolutely rejected you and your ways and rejected your prophets. And they've rejected you and your ways and your prophets so much that they practice idolatry and they have taken the prophets, my, you know, my people, they've taken the prophets and they have killed them all and I am the only one left and they want to kill me. Hmm. This is Elijah's perspective. What are you doing here? What's brought you here? Why are you in this place? Elijah's answer is, I'm in this place because I've served you. Why am I here? I'm here because of you. I'm here because you've brought me here. I'm here because you've brought me here and you have allowed your people to run wild. And so now none of them are faithful. None of them are good. None of them are righteous and none of them even care about it. I'm here because because of you, because I have been serving you. Do you 
You hear that answer? His answer is, what are you doing here? Blame. I'm blaming you, I'm blaming you, I'm blaming you. And the way he says it, it almost feels as if he's, you know, he's been jealous for God, but it seems almost like he's jealous of these other prophets who've been slain. Like you gave them a release. <laughs> you let them out of this. But I'm still here. I'm still serving. I'm still working for you. Even though I'm the only one. Sometimes people are like this. And by sometimes, I mean always, all the time. That's, that's us. Like that is so, like, okay. I, maybe I, I won't put this on you. I'll just put this, I'll say at least on me. Right, this is, this is so me, right? That like, I look at my life and my perspective is that I've got it rough. That I've got it rough. That it's, you know, things are just really tough. Right? And we become very myoptic. We only can see things in our perspective. This is especially true when we're depressed. When we're depressed, when we're down, it is very hard our clouds don't have any silver linings. Our future doesn't have any hope. Our prospects are zero. Our outlook is nothing. We, we blame and we see things from, this thing, from this very myoptic perspective and it feels as if it is absolutely the worst for us. Several years ago, um, Haley's little brother, played soccer. He was just a you know, little kid, and, uh, and he was playing soccer. I guess he was probably eight or nine years old, and, you know, we, you know, trying to be good, supportive, you know, brother-in-law and sister, we would go and we'd watch his soccer games, even though I am not a soccer fan by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, not at all. Um, but I would go, like, I don't even, I don't understand the rules of soccer. I don't know what I'm, what I'm watching. I think that soccer, in fact, I would say that nobody really understands soccer. And I say this because, like, if you ever listen, like, the people who are announcing soccer games, there will be a goal score, and they're, like, super surprised by it. Right, like they're just like talking, oh, goal out of nowhere. And they're just like, what, like they're surprised. So anyway, I don't think anybody really understands soccer. They just pretend. But he was playing soccer and he certainly didn't understand it because after this one game, he came, he came out, out of the, off the field um, and, and he was he like, hey, good job, man. He didn't do a good job. Good job, man. We went, you know, way to go, buddy. And he said, you know, the thing I don't like about this is that I'm running all the time. I was like, yeah, that is a good reason to not like soccer because it's just running all the time and running and running. He says, yeah, and I'm the only one running. I'm like, no, no, man, like everyone out there is running all the time. No, that's not possible. It's not possible everyone is running as much as me. Like, no, dude, everybody is running as much or more than you because some people played the whole game. Some people didn't like sit down in the middle of the field and start picking flowers, right? Like, yeah, so it, but that's us. That's us, and we look at our experience, we say, Ugh. we want to blame other people for our situations, and then we look at our situation, we say, oh, man, this is the worst. This is awful. This is so bad. And when you're in a state where you're depressed, we can't, we can't really see the reality of what's happening. We get so trapped in our own mindset, our own perspective, that we don't see the reality. And that's where Elijah is. I know this because I know the facts. Like, if you listen to Elijah, and this is one of those instances where the person who is speaking in the Bible, the person who is speaking, is not speaking God's absolute truth. He's wrong. So we have to read this passage. We have to read this passage and understand the reality and understand that his perspective is wrong. In this instance, Elijah, though he is one of the greatest prophets of all time, he is not speaking for God here. He's wrong. Because, here's how I know he's wrong. His, he's wrong because there were just people 40 days earlier who when they were confronted with the truth of who a living God is versus the false God of Baal, 
they pulled out swords and they slaughtered the prophets of Baal. He says, I, no one's faithful. No one still remembers you. No one still honors you. No one still, no. There were just a huge assembly of people on the mountaintop who believe. There's still a huge assembly of people who are out there who not only were they willing to say that they believe, but they were willing to put action behind that belief and slaughter these false prophets. He was, he was wrong. He was wrong even in his claim that he was the last of the prophets. He was wrong because Obadiah was alive at this point. And his story tells us that Obadiah gave shelter and hiding to a hundred prophets. To a hundred prophets so that Jezebel could not slaughter them. I'm the only one. You're one of a hundred. You're one of a hundred, Elijah. You're not the last of your kind. You're not the only one. You're one of a hundred. Get over yourself, dude. I'm the last prophet. You're not. Obadiah's out there. And Obadiah, not only is he a prophet of the Lord, but he's doing something to protect the other prophets. Mister, I'm going to go hide in the woods. I'm going to hide in a cave. Most powerful prophet of Israel since Moses is going to go hide and feel sorry for himself. I, I don't know if God actually ever uses that tone with you. Sometimes I feel like maybe he uses it. Oh, you feel so sorry for yourself. Right? And I have to imagine that that's what God is thinking here. He's like, Elijah, you're just wrong. You're seeing this situation so wrong. And you know how God expresses that to Elijah? He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't say, Elijah, I know you feel like you're the only one, but you're not. You feel like you're the last prophet, but you're not. He doesn't even say, listen, man, you're going to leave this mountain and you're going to find a man who will be a faithful king of, uh, for Israel. You're going to find a man who will be a faithful king for Syria. You're going to find a prophet who will pick up, who will take on your mantle. He doesn't even tell him that. He doesn't do any of that. Could he have? Absolutely. Would he have been right in saying it? Yeah, he would have been. Would it have been the best thing for Elijah? No, it wouldn't have been. I know that it wouldn't have been the best thing for Elijah because God is going to do what is best for him. That's not what he did. This is a big temptation for us. When we hear somebody who's depressed, when we hear somebody who's struggling, we want to tell them your perception's wrong. We want to say, you're wrong. You think you've got it worse than anybody's ever had it? You don't. Here, let me tell you about somebody who's had it worse. Is that, and I always, like, I wonder, is that, has that ever made anybody feel better? When they say, man, I've got it bad. Nuh-uh. Man, I feel horrible. Uh-uh. You shouldn't, because there's been people who've had it worse. Is that supposed to snap, like... You know, you're right. When Corey Ten Boom was in Ravensbrück in the concentration camp, she did have it worse. Thank you. Now I'll stop feeling so bad about my situation knowing that somebody at one point in history had it worse. No, that doesn't work. Let's stop trying to make that work. Right? Let's stop trying to make that work. Let's stop. Here's the other one. God doesn't say, but Elijah, at least you've got your health. I mean, you just completed a 250-mile hike. You're healthy, man. You're in good health. And, and you're a handsome fella. You're, you know, of all the prophets of Israel, you're probably the best-looking one. Yeah, you are. He doesn't say, but Elijah, you came from a good home. But Elijah, you've got... He doesn't, he doesn't try to give a silver lining to the storm that Elijah's facing. He doesn't try to change his perspective by revealing some truth to him. What he does instead is so much more powerful than that. So much more powerful than saying, nah, you're wrong. Your perspective on yourself, it's wrong. It's so much more powerful than saying, no, things aren't as bad as you think. Things are good. Things are getting better. It's so much bigger and better than that. What, what God does for Elijah instead is he gives him what he needs in verse 11, God says, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. 
and behold, the Lord passed by. He could have said, you're wrong. He could have said, things are going to get better. He could have said, things are better than you imagine. But instead, he's present with him. He says, go out on the mountain. And before Elijah can even get to the outside on the mountain, the Lord's there. Before Elijah even goes to the place of meeting and of healing, the Lord is present because the Lord was always present with him. The Lord was always with him. God was never absent. God didn't need Elijah to answer the question, what are you doing here? God wanted Elijah to hear his answer. God wanted Elijah to answer that question for himself more than answer it for God. Elijah needed to understand why he thought he was there. The reality is, is that God had allowed him to come to this place so that he could meet with Elijah. That's the answer. What are you doing here? I'm here to meet with you. What are you doing here? I'm, I'm here to have an experience with you like only one of two people in all of human history will ever have. I'm here to meet with you, but that wasn't what he was there. What he was there for was to just talk to God and tell him how bad things were. God knew. God was there through all of it. And God says, what you need isn't a new perspective, a new reality. It isn't a silver lining. What you need is to be with me. You need to spend some time with me. And so God passed by. And verse 11 says, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. Now, we might look at this and think, whoa, God has just broken the earth. That's powerful. That is God's power on display. Surely, this wind that breaks the earth apart, that's God. No. It says the Lord is not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. Well, surely that's God. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. I mean, God just showed himself through fire, right? Like 40 days earlier. He showed himself through fire on that other mountain with all those prophets. So prophet, you know, will see the fire and say, well, surely this is the Lord, but the Lord was not in the fire. These things, this, this wind. Don't get me wrong. Like the Lord is described in different ways, in different places as a wind, as a rushing wind, he's described as being, you know, one that can make the mountains tremble. He, in the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God descends on them like tongues of fire, right? Like when Moses encounters a bush, it's a burning bush. Like these are really good biblical ways to understand God's presence in people's lives, but none of them are how Elijah needs to experience God right then. None of them are adequate for where Elijah is. None of them are meeting Elijah in a place that he needs to be met by the Lord. And then, after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Do you see this picture here? God has said, Elijah, what are you doing here? He says, well, I'm here because of you. I'm here because of this situation. I'm here because the situation that I face is so horrible. And he says, come, come out here and meet with me. And he sends a mighty wind. He makes the earth shake and break. He comes and he, he, he shows fire on this mountain top. And Elijah watches all of it. Elijah's watching the wind break the rocks apart. He watches the mountains tremble under God's might. He watches the fire. But when he hears this still, small voice, he covers his face. He covers his face. Not when the Lord passes by, 
But when he hears this quiet voice from the Lord, he is humbled by it. He covers his face because he recognizes his unworthiness to be in the presence of a holy God. Because it wasn't the fire. It wasn't the fire that made him recognize his unworthiness. It wasn't God's might in the trembling or in the breaking of the rocks from the wind. It was that still, small voice. The Lord was in it. Because of it, Elijah covers his face. Sometimes when we find those we love in a place where, like where Elijah is, Sometimes we think in terms of, of maybe a grand gesture. We think of like what sort of big thing needs to happen in a person's life. But that's not it. It isn't that when that person in your life who's depressed, who's dealing with fears and, and, and issues, it isn't that they really need you to show up with some big powerful solution. They don't need you to show up and I've got all the answers. They just need you to show up. They just need you to show up. Because the power of God that's shown to Elijah, the power of God that can be shown to people in your life through you, isn't in you bending air or making fire. It's in you having a calming voice. And you having a presence in someone's life. What people need spiritually isn't some big show, it isn't some big miracle. It is simply to know that God is there. We sang a song last week at the close of our service, Weep With Me, and that's, that's it. That's what we, we ultimately need from the Lord. I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I'd love it if God could just snap his fingers and make COVID go away and then snap them again to make cancer disappear and do, you know, mighty works. But what we need more than even that is to know that God is with us, to know that in the midst of our trials that God is present. There was a, there was a poem etched into etched into a, a basement wall in a concentration camp written by one of the, the prisoners who would, who would later be, be murdered. It says, I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. I believe in love even when there's no one there. I believe in God even when he is silent. I believe in any trial, there is always a way. Sometimes in this suffering and hopeless despair, I cry out for shelter and to know someone's there. Then a voice rises within me saying, hold on my child, I'll give you strength, I'll give you hope. Just stay a little while. That's what we need. That's what we need. We need to know that God is present. We need to know that God isn't silent, but sometimes his voice is very quiet. Sometimes what we need is to quiet the voices in our own head, to quiet the fears, the doubts, the anxieties, to quiet all of those things enough so that we can hear the Lord speaking. And sometimes we need a friend to help us do that. Sometimes we need someone to come alongside us to help us to hear that still small voice. After this, after Elijah has covered his face and he's moved to the entrance of the cave, and behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Same question. Same question and Elijah gives the same answer. And this is one of the instances where I wish that the Bible was on audible, like, like I could listen to it, because I have to imagine, I imagine that the first time Elijah said this answer, that he gave it with a very broken, dejected tone. 
But I imagine that in the second time that he said it, he recognizes the frailty of his thinking. He recognizes how flawed his perspective has been. The second time he answers the question, he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. First time he answers, it seems as if he's saying, my life's a mess. Haven't you been paying attention? But the second time he answers, it's, he knows that God's been paying attention. He knows that God is present. He knows that God weeps for him and weeps with him. And so even though his circumstances haven't changed, his outlook has. The Lord said to him, and he, here's how I know that his outlook has changed. Because the words are the same. The words are the same from one answer to the next. But the reason that I know that his outlook has changed between that first response and that second response is what comes next. But after the first response, after the first response, the Lord says, here, come and have an experience with me. He says, this is what you need. Imagine, imagine that you went to the doctor, right? You went to the doctor's office and the doctor says, what brings you in today, right? Which is always an interesting thing to me. And, you know, Kimmy, you're a nurse. Maybe you can answer this. The nurse comes in and the nurse is like, what brings you in today? And you tell the nurse why you're there. The nurse, I'm assuming, writes it down because they're always typing something when you answer, why are you there? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, okay, mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. all right, yeah, all right. And then the doctor comes in and asks the same thing. Like, do doctors just assume that we lie to the nurses? Is that it? Okay, that's it, all right. Doctors assume we're liars. Um, but yeah, you, you go to the doctor, the doctor's like, why are you here? What brings you here today? And you lay, lay out your symptoms. And then the doctor gives you a treatment and you're cured. And the doctor says, no, why is it you were here today? Why'd you come in today? And you say, well, these are the symptoms. These are the symptoms, but I'm not suffering from them anymore. The answer of why you came in is the same. The answer of why you were there, of what brought you there, it's the same answer, but your outlook is completely different. If doctors had some sort of magic pill, they could ask that same question before and after, get the same answer, but your thinking, your response internally would be completely different. God says, what's brought you here today? Elijah gives the answer. God gives the healing. God gives the healing, and then he asks, now what was it that brought you here? And the answer's still the same. But now, the second time, God's response is different. God's response is different. If you went to your doctor and you said, what brought you here today? And you said, oh, I, I'm having this issue. It's killing me. I'm, I am dying with this thing, with this condition, with this circumstance. It's killing me. And the doctor didn't give you any sort of treatment, asked this question again, and you said, well, it's, it's killing me. And the doctor said, okay, go on your way. We would say that is the worst doctor ever. Horrible. Like, can you imagine going to the doctor and not getting any sort of treatment? Like, you go in and you're clearly, this is the experience, this is what's going on with me, and the doctor's like, wow, that stinks. That'll be $250. You say, what, what? Why am I, why am I gonna pay you? You didn't treat me. All you did was like, listen and ask me two times what was wrong. We would not expect a doctor to send you on your way saying, I'm still dying. That's why I know that the second time Elijah says the same thing, the second time is different. Because after the first time, God responds by saying, here is your treatment. Here's what you need to be better. The second time, God says, you're better. Now you can go. Elijah answers the question of what has brought him there, what is he doing there. 
and God answers. He says to him, go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Jephat, of Abel Mihola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. He says, you're better now. You needed some treatment. You needed this experience with me. And now that you've had it, even though your reasons for where you've been and why you've been there are the same, now you're ready to move forward. And you're going to serve me. And you're going to serve me by anointing a king for Syria and a king for Israel, by taking on one who will take your place to be a prophet after you are gone. God continues, and, and the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel shall Jehu put to the death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. He says, you're going to go forward, and you're going to see that I'm not done with Israel. You're going to see that I'm not done with you. You have a future, you have a hope, you have a promise. Sometimes people who are, who are suicidal, they can describe things, they can look at their situation and they can, to them it, it makes sense. In fact, I would think that part of what Satan does in creating these ideas and putting these thoughts into people's minds. Sometimes he even convinces that this is the logical conclusion. Sometimes it, he, he will even present suicide as being a noble answer. That Jesus sacrificed himself for the good of the world. And so, aren't you? Can't you look and see that your family, your friends, that everybody would be better without you? Maybe your sacrifice could be seen as noble the way Jesus is, but this is an appeal that Satan makes, much like the one he made to Eve. Surely you will not die, but you will be more like God. It's there, the temptation. It's there, and it's clearly one that is not of God. It's clearly one that's not honoring God. This week... Um, this week, two people that I knew through other people left this world. One was a, a mother of seven children. One was a pastor, a pastor of thousands of people. A man who started a church, he founded a church, and it just grew and grew and grew. One who started a family that just grew and grew and grew. The pastor started a, a church and it grew to be a mega church and he, his name was Darren Patrick and he, he preached and he taught and he spoke at conferences and he wrote books and he was featured in podcasts and as far as like pastors go, he was like, like kind of like a celebrity pastor. I don't know if that's a, a real thing or not, but like he was, you know, I think when you see your name on the dust jacket of a book, you kind of look and you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm somebody now, right? And he, he was, like people knew him. People liked him. He pastored one mega church, and then he became a teaching pastor at another after some difficulties in his life, some issues with sin. And he had this restoration. And this other person who lost her life, she raised children. And we, we have that verse, her children shall rise up and call her blessed. And they did. And she left this world Surrounded by her children and her grandchildren, they, they held hands around her bed as she was finally giving up her battle with cancer. They held hands around her bed and they sang blessed assurance as she left this world. And I can't think of a better way to leave this world behind than that. And this pastor 
he left this world on, a, on an outing. And the reports of it say that he died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. A self-inflicted gunshot wound. It said, the story I read about it again and again said self-inflicted gunshot wound. Friends of mine who are, friend, who are friends of his, I didn't know Darren Patrick, but friends of mine who were friends of his as they reported it, as they talked about it, as they went on Facebook and they described the feelings of his loss, they talked about it as a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Do you see it? Do you see what this is? This is people, even pastors, who understand suicide still looking at it and saying, oh no, it's just too dirty, it's too ugly to talk about it. So let's, let's wrap it in, in different language. Let's talk about it in a different way. We have to be willing to talk about this. We have to be willing to talk about it, to call it what it is, to say that, say that even pastors who hear confession, even pastors who have experiences with God, even prophets who have amazing experiences with God, even they are susceptible to depression, to suicidal thoughts. Even they are, are susceptible to it. This is real. It happens. And we're we're not going to make it any better by pretending that it doesn't exist. This isn't the monster that's under your kid's bed. This isn't the monster that's under your kid's bed that you can just ignore it because it's not there. This isn't the boogeyman in the closet. This is a monster that is killing people. In the last 20 years, we've seen Incidence of suicide increased by 30%. If there was any other disease that escalated with that, this rapid a rate, we would be giving so much money. We would be spending millions and millions and billions of dollars to solve it. Hashtag COVID-19 response, right? But this is happening and we just don't want to talk about it. We need to. Because... Because the answer to it, the answer to this situation, it isn't some gigantic miracle that only God can do. It isn't shaking the earth. It isn't a roaring wind. It isn't fire from the sky. The answer is a still small voice. And sometimes that voice is the voice of God and sometimes that voice is the voice of a neighbor. Sometimes that voice is the voice of a friend. Sometimes it's the voice of a, of a spouse, of a child, of a parent. So let us, let us weep together. Let us not be tempted to say, no, your perspective's wrong. Things are better than you think. Things aren't so bad. Instead, let us just, let us just take the time to be present with one another, to give a voice even though you may feel like your voice is very small, even though you may feel like the words that you have to say are not powerful or eloquent, they're enough. They're enough. Let's pray together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our suffering, that you meet with us. That you meet with us, that you, that you weep over us, that you weep with us. That you, who has a perfect understanding and perspective, don't merely correct our poor thinking, but that you come alongside us and you speak to us calm and low. Lord, we pray that. Lord, I pray that, that everyone who is hearing this message today, Lord, if they are having these thoughts, if they are thinking that maybe the world would be better without them, Lord, I pray that, that you would send a still, small voice. Whether that voice is yours or ours, I pray that you would send it. 
We pray that you would help us to see that the trials that we're facing, that people, other people have faced them, and that there are people who want to come alongside us to help us, that there are people who want to be present with us. Lord, I pray that you would be, help us to be a people who are not scared of open wounds, that we would be a people who can look at broken hearts and broken minds and say, we love you and we're here with you. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus.